Pourquoi est-ce qu'en réalité nous avons voulu faire l'Europe au lendemain de la Deuxième Guerre mondiale L'Europe n'a pas été faite, nous avons eu la guerre. L'Europe ne se fera pas d'un coup, ni dans une construction d'ensemble. Elle se fera par des réalisations concrètes, créant d'abord une solidarité de fait. We must recreate the European family in a regional structure, called it may be the United States of Europe. Was uns vorwärts treibt, ist zur Genüge bekannt. Es gibt ein unzerstörbares europäisches Selbstgefühl. If at first all the states of Europe are not willing or able to join the Union, we must nevertheless proceed to assemble and combine those who will and those who can. Ce premier marché commun, ces premières institutions supranationales, c'est l'Europe qui commence à s'unir. For me, this is about peace. It's about the most successful project for freedom that this, this world has ever seen. EU was created as a, as a way to create peace, as a structure which creates a variety of ways to cooperate, to communicate and to do things together. And that's by itself uh, forces people not to fight. The European Union, since it started a little bit after the Second World War, has avoided war for 70 uh, years. If you can understand the way other people think about a certain problem, then you are always going to be closer to consensus. El proyecto europeo es hijo de la Segunda Guerra Mundial y de la crisis de entreguerras y de los fascismos, de la violencia, de la guerra y de las destrucciones que sufrió el continente europeo. Es un proyecto que quiere decir basta con las guerras, basta con la violencia. Es un discurso, digamos, a favor de la paz y la solidaridad. My first speech to the Scottish Parliament, that fell on an important anniversary for my family because on that day, 100 years previously, my great uncle was killed along with 80% of his battalion on the first day of the Battle of Montserrat. His name is Alexander Bennett, I'm named for him. A generation later, two of my grandfather's four siblings were killed on European battlefields. I think in a measure of the success of this European project, that I am only the second generation in the recorded history of my entire family to never contemplate war with another European country. What we are doing now is we are building a process, a process of acceptance forever, that will last generations after us. Diversity of European Union is something that, even if the European Union doesn't exist, we have to keep it and build on it. This is something we must not, must not lose. We are to some extent at a fork in the road. So either we go in the direction of more integration or we choose a more limited Europe. And I think there's no easy answer to this. I think if you have an easy answer to this, it's usually ideologically driven rather than what would be, let's say, the best for the EU polity. I'm an American from Washington, D.C. originally, who has lived in Bulgaria for more than six years now and is planning on living here permanently, eventually getting citizenship and, uh, yeah, making a life here. Me coming from the outside as an American, the EU just blew my mind. And that's something actually was really interesting about being in, in Bulgaria and the European Union more widely. A lot of younger people, they've never experienced anything else, and so I find they take it for granted. Greater openness, greater movement, is the way forward. That is the, uh, a future that I believe in and a future that's worth fighting for. The Schengen Agreement was signed in 1985. This was the moment when the Benelux countries took the initiative to talk to Germany and France and ask them if they wanted to join their open border space. And that was basically the Schengen Agreement. Schengen is only a little village in Luxembourg at the Moselle River, only 560 inhabitants. But a special thing about Schengen is that it's in the border triangle. On the other side of the Moselle River, you are in Germany and in France. 
If you're a very young person, you do not know the borders. For you, it's a very normal thing to travel from one country to another because you never knew that there was a time when you had to queue at the border and show your passport, and then you would really feel you come from one country to another. For people my age, of course, I know that it was something very special. It was a very big step into European identity. This is really one of the biggest achievements we have. And very often it's easy to say, well, we close the borders and everything will be fine. I think this is definitely not the case. The problems of today, they do not come with the open borders. I think the most important thing is to talk about how would it be if this would come back to what it was before. A country, half of which has been and it still is occupied by a foreign army for more than 30 something years. Since 2001, I think, the so called borders opened. They allow us to go as visitors. We have to ask permission from the people that live in our house to look at it. And of course, the ones that dare to do that are always afraid the moment they reach their uh, village or their house that oh, what kind of behavior they will have. It's not a nice feeling. I mean, you are asking for permission to enter your own garden. I grew up feeling from the beginning that I was not allowed to dream freely. You know, if you take a human being and tell them, you know, you are not allowed to go buy a house at the mountains of Italy, a European citizen, I'll tell you why. Now imagine telling a Cypriot, a Turkish Cypriot, or a Greek Cypriot, you are not allowed to go to live in Larnaca. And you're not allowed to go to Kirinya. He might say okay for a while. But deep inside, he will not be satisfied. And it would be easy for, for that feeling of unfairness to grow up and bring us into a new situation. If, if we make a compromise in Cyprus, if we sign as legal something that's illegal, then at a later point of our history, we might have to make the same compromise for other European countries. Maybe 10 years ago, it was still okay to talk about uh, free borders or opening borders even. We still have Schengen by changing. Now we start to have borders already inside Schengen area. In 2060, I was one of the activists who were marching for the free movement from Italy to Austria in Brenner Pass. And basically we were just doing what we have a right to do. We were marching from one Schengen country to another, but there was a lot of police violence and there was very strong police uh, forces from Austria stopping us from doing that. It's incredibly easy to travel around, really easy to go around the the border to go across the borders, very easy to go across the borders. Um, while it's been quite a challenging trip for us, there's been nothing easier than crossing borders. Um, we've had an incredible welcome from people from 16 countries, we're now at country number 16. And we've met all sorts of people who've talked to us about their lives, and about their fears and hopes for, for Europe. It doesn't matter where one is born, you can change that what Brexit made me realise, suddenly it does matter for British people where, I'm, where I was born. I was born into 
the European Union, so I kind of took for granted all the rights I have as a European citizen, and I think Brexit kind of made me suddenly feel how these things are important and how I could actually lose them. I think when you come from the UK, the, the border is very obvious. There's a big lump of sea going around <laughs> the island. And I think the difference in that and land borders is you realise there's, there's no difference. People cross the border for shopping, for family, for work. People constantly go across the borders for one reason or another. We had the opportunity to actually cycle across ex-borders, cycle paths that have been created after the, the Iron Curtain came down. So these are all like cycle paths now. But it wasn't even that long ago, uh, so it feels quite sudden that today people want to build walls again. Like that we wouldn't have been able to do this trip a few decades ago. And that's why also we think we might just as well do it now before it's too late. Um, before 2007, we joined EU in 2007. Before 2007, it was very really difficult for me to travel abroad. Uh, they always would stop us on the border, check all the luggage, stay there for hours and hours and hours, sometimes even, I don't know, 12 hours. And two times I was rejected to enter, even though I had all the necessary documents, all the necessary invitations, uh, visa, everything, money in the bank, like all the um, proofs you need. I was traveling with my family, still. We were all rejected to enter with no explanation. This was the Italian border, always. They would put a stamp, then put a cross on the stamp, and then would tell us, you can complain within 14 days in the court in Trieste, which is Italy. So they're rejecting us to enter Italy, but we can complain within 14 days in Italy. You have everything, but they just refuse, reject, because they can. Now, Whatever they tell me, they cannot really stop me. I just can go anywhere. I have to say, people who are coming from countries that are not part of EU, they have a lot of difficulties, much more difficulties, in entrepreneurship, in traveling, in mobility, in studying. All of these aspects are pretty, pretty difficult. But I have been living now for seven years, no, it's almost eight years abroad. And I have done all these travels worldwide and I'm still based in Vienna and I still have a Macedonian passport. And I can't believe that I did it with that Macedonian passport, but I did it. I do have to apply for visas and I do have extra procedures for everywhere I go. It's really different. I always stand in a different line than my colleagues from Vienna. It's an experiment on its own. I keep my passport with all the, with all the stamps. Maybe they make it to a museum one day when we don't have visas anymore. The independent state of Latvia was occupied by the Soviet Union in 1940, then by Nazi Germany in 1941, and then again by Soviet Union during World War II from 1944 till 1945. I was 13 years old when my family decided that since the Soviet army is going to return, my father had worked in the police force during independence, that it was either, if we stay, a free ticket to Siberia, or if we don't stay, and if we go, we can uh, go to Germany that had occupied us at that time. But since Soviet Union, 1940-41, had deported people, had killed people, persecuted people, somehow Germany, which committed worse atrocities, including the Holocaust. Germany somehow seemed, at this point, the only exit that was possible. During the second part of the Soviet occupation, you did not really know, are we ever going to be able to become independent again? And in some ways, independence came as a kind of sudden event. What happened when the borders became more or less open? And of course, especially after Latvia joined the EU, became a Schengen state, is the amazing, amazing drive to get out and to explore what's happening in the West. 
people filled buses and came and uh, visited and uh, tried to learn and so on. Yet, to some extent, the attitudes and the mentality of the long Soviet period persist, or the thinking patterns persist. So it's the question, when these will slowly fade out, and when will the new European educated <laughs> people come in and uh, take over the guidance of the state? So we are right now in this transition period. Many things are still in balance. I think they're moving in the right direction, but for many people too slowly. I think that nowadays we sometimes even forget how much we have done in this process to become the member of the EU and to become a member of NATO and to become a member of OECD. It has brought enormous reforms. We had to fight with stereotypes about ourselves and in between ourselves, how we perceive ourselves, but also uh, what we really want to achieve. It was a huge process. You know, in physics, there is this aspect of pendulum effect. If we use that when talking about history, we would think if we had 50 years of Soviet occupation, we would need 50 years for kind of rehabilitation. <laughs> but we wanted it faster. We didn't have 50 years again. We wanted it now. I was born, for example, during the, the Soviet occupation time. I remember my grandmother telling stories about democracy, about how fights among political parties took place, so that when Latvia regained independence, we somehow naturally understood that we have to get back to democracy. We have to just, just get back to normal. I feel like I am a European, even before a Spaniard. And I'm very Spanish, but I'm also very European. I've lived in the Netherlands for uh, a long time, and I work at an institution where there are over 50 nationalities. I feel, especially when I go back to Spain, that I'm not like I used to be. I am a little bit different. I have a little bit of Spain, but I also have a little bit of what's typical in France or what's typical in the Netherlands or what's typical in Britain. After living here for many years, I went back to Spain and I lived there for a year. It took me almost that whole year to get used to living in Spain again and getting used to having dinner at nine o'clock in the evening. When you go back to your own country, that's when you really realize that you have changed, that you have internalized other customs and that also the people in your country have changed. In your heart, you still feel very Spanish or French or whatever nationality, but you're very European because you've also internalized other customs and other ways and other views. And uh, I think this is, this is fantastic. Having the opportunity to live in another country in Europe or feeling European, traveling around Europe is the best way to be able to look at problems from very different perspectives and to have a global view. I was born in Yugoslavia. My father is Serbian, my mom is Hungarian, and we moved back to Hungary around 92. I've been living in Spain for the past nine, nine and a half years now. The reason I moved here was love. I used to live in the UK, in Bristol. Um, I was working there as an assistant manager for the restaurant. And he walked in, he asked my number, and then we fell in love. And a couple of weeks later, I was already in Barcelona. So we moved in together and I decided to stay because of the, the nature, the people, the culture. I, I love to live in the UK, but somehow this is closer to my heart. I find that people who move abroad, they try to stick together with, with their own people. But somehow, when I, when I used to live in the UK, when I was traveling as well a lot, um, my aim was never to, to, to be surrounded by, by Hungarians. And the reason behind it, just to understand more the culture and, and to be able to speak the language as well. I have Hungarian friends, and since I have a daughter here, I would like her to, to speak the language. But I really want her to travel. 
I really think that that it gives you all the perspectives. You you get to know all the different cultures, and that's what I'm hoping for her as well. I come from a very cultural family. I have like six or five different nationalities in my family, so I never really felt like I fitted in. It's, it's very strict in Denmark. It's very square. It seems open-minded, but it's not really. You need to fit into a box, and I don't fit into any box. So it's it's always been really difficult for me to to feel happy there. So very um, early, I decided that I wanted to live in another country. The year I had to move, I came here in April, and I just knew that I had to move here. So that year in July, I moved here. I was very young when I moved. 21, so I, I didn't really take all the things into consideration, how much I depended on friends and family. And that was, uh, that was pretty tough, especially as being so young, 21, you know. When I started, I, I figured out how easy it was to get friends, and, and they were all different nationalities. I love uh, experiencing new things and like learning new things from other cultures and like having friends across Borders, if you can say it like that, you know, I think it's beautiful. I think it's amazing and I think we can learn so much from it. Now, I'm actually getting married or something called Pareja de Hecho with my partner because he's from Canada. It's been really hard to understand how he feels he can lose everything that he's built up uh, because he simply didn't have papers because I've always had papers. As a European citizen, like we're so lucky that we can go to any city and live within Europe, which I think a lot of, many of us take for granted, you know? This uh, freedom of moving around and working where you want, international working, it's a kind of freedom, but it's freedom for whoever knows how to use it. For me, it was, okay, let's go, learn some stuff, go back, yeah, I think there is a split. I mean, there is one group that they say like, uh, now with these open borders, uh, our kids left and now they're not home. And the others say like, oh, our kids, they left and they're not home, but they're in good hands, let's say. These countries are very attractive to stay there, but in other hands, it's like not home. Yeah, it feels better when you're here. <laughs> it's like that. Europe. Tiny continent, 50 countries, everybody hates each other. Yeah, especially the neighbor, neighboring countries. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's complicated. I cannot say I'm for uh, the concept of one big country in the world that rules all. You're not but the dystopian kind. <laughs> well, you, some people say go dystopia, some utopia. Us Bulgarians and other tiny nations have a really pronounced feeling of, uh, you know, self-pride which is based on nothing in particular, like I could be born somewhere else and I would be that nationality, but I feel like a Bulgarian and I felt weird about it when I was living uh, actually in Germany for two years. All of my early years in high school and uni, I was telling everybody that people should stay here, you know, just make babies, make families, best place in the world. And then I, I just fell in love with a Hungarian girl and we're together and trying to find a place and I realized that chances are it's neither gonna be Bulgarian nor Hungary. So I feel weird about it, but I guess I'll have to make a compromise and become part of the statistics of the expats, another Bulgarian expat. It benefits us sometimes maybe actual balance in terms of age. It's incredibly focused and geared towards young people. Young people are most likely to move and travel around and be flexible in that sense. But when I start thinking about it that, okay, I'm 55 and I soon would like to retire, then we're actually in a situation where I don't think that they get that much of those opportunities out of it. It is kind of fair to ask whether the added value of the European Union has been equally distributed. In my everyday job, I meet a lot of people in every generation. 
Alert people, they are complaining because their families are abroad. They, they cannot communicate with them on an everyday basis. They are afraid of traveling. They don't know foreign languages and uh, they feel uh, trapped in Bulgaria because uh, uh, they're not used to travel and they refuse to travel. People in Bulgaria, especially older ones, they're used to think in a negative way of uh, globalization. They think that uh, they are, uh, kids are stolen from them. They're feeling pain because they can't live their lives closely to their relatives. And it's uh, just physical pain sometimes. I mean, people are leaving. There are, there are jobs in Bulgaria. I mean, if somebody tells you that there are no jobs in Bulgaria, that's a lie. There are jobs in Bulgaria, but they just don't pay enough. I feel like Bulgarian. I mean, I know that we are part of a union with 28 other, 27 other countries, but I really feel like a Bulgarian. I mean, nothing has changed for me. The currency is the same. The only thing that have changed is that we are allowed to travel without visa, that we can work abroad, but that doesn't affect me much. So I feel like a Bulgarian, not like a part somebody who is part of the European Union. I would love to uh, bring back communism at some point. I'm not sad about these people leaving our country. Everyone in Bulgaria says Bulgaria is not worth anymore. But that's not true. That's not true. And that's why uh, young uh, boys and girls are leaving our country for a better future. But that's not true. Because if you want to and you have a potential, you can do this here. Right now, we need these girls and boys to focus on our country's future and not for only theirs. If we're a country, we should think about everyone, everyone in this country. So if they want to leave, let them leave. But the people who choose to stay, they will make the future of our country. And they will call themselves proud Bulgarians, not the ones who leave. People ask me, how do you identify as a nationality? I would have never said European. I would have maybe said Macedonian. I would have maybe said ex-Yugoslavian. But I would have not said European. When I traveled and stayed in Singapore for a while, and then in Africa, there I am European. Because the Balkans is not something that people recognize. And that was the first moment when I realized if I stayed in Europe all the time, all my life, probably I would have never used this word because no one would have needed it for a reference. Because if I said Macedonia or Balkan, that was not enough. Even Austria is not known in some of these countries where I traveled. So European was the only reference I could use. Brain drain in Macedonia is one of the biggest challenges at the moment. But I also have to say I have a very radical opinion about that. I think people should leave. I think they should go abroad. And at some point, it's really amazing how much their mind and heart will go back, whether physically or intellectually, or they will invest money. I'm not worried at all that there will be no people left in Macedonia. I don't think that's possible. I don't think that's possible in any country. I think people should go abroad. That way we evolve. That way our identities evolve. And we will come to a spot in time, for sure everyone comes to that spot, where they want to go back to their roots. And they will go back. And I mean, I'm not based in Macedonia at the moment, but I have to say 90% of my free time that I have here, I spent on projects that are related to Macedonia. And I can tell you, I can do much more for Macedonia from here than from within. You know, we kind of lost our pride and we lost our sort of identity as Romanians. That's why when I say that I'm traveling abroad, I never forget to say that I'm Romanian, actually, you know. Maybe you don't know where that country is exactly in Europe or what that country does or what it's famous for, but it's important for people to know it's there. And in some parts of Romania, people think, oh, there is no, absolutely no chance for you here. Just go away. People would probably say, well, why do you even have the right to comment on that? You're already out. You're already moved to another country, right? Okay, I moved there for, for university purposes and probably I'm going to stay, I'm going to stick for a little while after graduation, but that doesn't make me less Romanian. I can give something back to the society, but not necessarily only in Romania, but in Europe. I'm going to help people as well, not necessarily only because they are Romanians or not, I'm going to help Europeans. I'm going to invest as well the effort in telling them about Romania and about our culture or our tradition as much as possible.
it's important to break the stigma and break yeah. the circle. I've been to, to South America, to Asia, and some of the bordering countries in Azerbaijan, Armenia, etc. There, I, I feel much more European than in Europe, which is a bit sad. In Europe, you still need to prove a lot about being a Bulgarian European. You're still the Bulgarian European, not the European European. But things are changing slowly because I could feel this much more five years ago. We are traveling a lot and the other European countries saw that we are just normal people. But it still takes time. I think that in 10 years or even less, there will be no difference between Bulgarian European and French European, for example. Everybody knows the truth. It's not a secret. We know what is the quality of life, the level of the standards, and uh, we can see the differences in the prices, in the way people live, in the way people think about their country, about their lives, about their work. There is a huge gap. I even noticed some kind of envy in the people and they say the only salvation is to escape and go away from Bulgaria and go to work to Western Europe. What I feel is that knowing more and being more to the Western Europe actually makes people more angry about not being there, about not uh, having the same way of life, not having the same standard. I'm not sure it makes us more proud and more European. In some way, the average people feel even more miserable. When you live in a country, you don't see the progress that the country is making. But once you go in and out, you see, you see the developments. And particularly in comparison with the candidate countries in the Western Balkans, I see how much progress Bulgaria has done. Of course, as Bulgarians, we are always critical towards our politicians, towards uh, the speed of development and how slow we have been in comparison with other new members of the European Union. But uh, um, we really do not give ourselves uh, the benefit of the doubt. I am European, first. Then I'm Lithuanian and the rest. But people like me, we were formed in 2004. We were the first ones widely to use the Erasmus programs. All my friends left to study abroad because there was this opportunity. I wasn't living in Lithuania until 2015, basically. As for many people who, who were not touched, by these possibilities. It's a little bit different. It's more abstract. You know, there's this flag and this European day and wherever and blah, blah, but it doesn't really touch that much. And it's a part of the problem because now I guess it started touching more and more people like me or people who travel. And then there is a resentment. The discussion appears, you know, that if European Union is destroying our identity, whatever it might be, you know. In 2004, we were Euro optimist. We were happy to belong to the club of the, of the West, of the stronger country, and so on and so forth. Now I believe we have a bigger share of people who actually share the values, but it's also we, st we start having the people who are getting scared of that. It's like, no, no, we reject that. So you cannot say that European identity doesn't exist. I think it starts existing, and what we see in Europe, it's the reaction to the fact that a certain group of people started feeling European. I think that's a huge worry of a lot of people. They have this strong national identity and to become more European would make them less Bulgarian or less Austrian. The identities are not mutually exclusive. To say you're French or Irish or German um, and to say you're European, there's no tension there. You can be both. You can have multiple identities, multiple groups that you want to interact with. Uh, in Ireland, I think the Good Friday Agreement was a great example of this. We codified the idea that you can be Irish, British, neither, both, and European all at the same time. And it doesn't take away from one identity to also have another. If you look at some of the successes that the EU has had in trying to foster a European identity, the Erasmus programme is a very good idea. Erasmus is good and Erasmus is interesting, not because people can travel around and see how everybody is the same as them, but they can see that everybody is different than them and yet we still work in this one larger community. And I think that that's what the future of a European identity needs to be. It needs to lie above national identities and it needs to embrace national identities, national differences, regional identities, linguistic identities. All of those things can exist under the umbrella of European identity. I don't think Europe should replace 
the member states in any respect. However, I truly hope that particularly younger generations with all the possibilities that the European Union offers, I hope that there is a certain sense of that there's also a larger we. I've lived in several member states, but I've also lived uh, quite a while in the US. And you feel ne nowhere more European than outside of Europe. So maybe uh, we should have an Erasmus beyond the borders of Europe. You know, in the U.S., if you want to study abroad, you pay for it 100 percent. And it is generally very expensive, such that very few Americans study abroad anymore. It's becoming less and less common because it's financially unfeasible. And I look at Europeans who go off on Erasmus and they get a small stipend to help them cover the costs and everything. And it makes it so much more accessible for people to get those kinds of really valuable learnings that can only come from living in a society that's different than yours. We would never have something like that because we would think, oh, but someone is going to abuse the system. And what if someone misuses that money and does something that they shouldn't with it? You know, we don't accept that no program is perfect and that, you know, uh, people will always abuse a system. But the point is not that if there's even a chance that someone could one day abuse the system, then there's no point building it. That's what we got from the EU. We had the chance. You didn't have to be wealthy to be able to study abroad. So it was your decision to think outside the box maybe at that point or make somebody think as my friend forced me in a way to, to apply to Amsterdam. She was taught to think outside the box and she taught me. I feel European maybe more than Polish right now because I was able to uh, travel. I'm obviously very proud that I'm Polish, but I don't want to necessarily fall into those nationalistic, xenophobic narratives. Coming from a traditional conservative, mostly conservative background to one of the most, if not the most liberal country in the EU was, uh, was quite a shock. One of my best friends came to visit. I asked her to come with me to my sexuality class. I remember the teacher drawing a penis or something. It was something to do with biological ideas of sexuality. And she was like, what, what is going on here? And I was like, listen, wait, wait, just, just listen. And she was like, you can have a class like that and you can talk about it? coming back to Poland and realizing how bad the situation was with the sexuality education, that it doesn't work, it doesn't exist actually, I realized that it's time to do something of my own. So I started to study sexuality, I started to think about idea for my PhD thesis, and then I applied and that's how I did my research. Even like a decade ago, there have been voices coming from this region to countries of Western Europe, that you have to be aware that there is something happening in this region that may contribute to stopping the international progress on reproductive rights and also sexual rights. For a very long time, countries of, uh, of Western Europe have been quite ignorant to these issues. It seems like many organizations from the Western world that were really concentrated mainly on advocacy for the Global South they failed to notice that there is something happening in Europe. Now we are in the EU, but still the EU cannot influence national legislation when it comes to issues such as abortion, contraception, sexuality education, the right to health, the right to life. All these issues are being questioned by countries from this region. We are in a dreadful situation. A group of MPs submitted a motion to check constitutionality of abortion in case of fetal impairment. 95% of legal abortions performed in Poland are due to this case. So actually we face in practice a total abortion ban. that we, we are like in a nightmare. Why, who and what they want to do with half of the society. It was crazy. The right to choose is a human right. It's obvious that I should decide about my body and about my future life. Reality in Poland, that's not good, but the level of consciousness is now really high. After this first black protest, all of media around the world were like, Polish women win! And we were like, we haven't won anything! 
I remember giving so many interviews saying, okay, this was a big success, and we are not saying that it wasn't, but still, there is really bad situation right now in Poland. It's true that the black protest was the first successful attempt which made the government withdraw from their intention and they voted the then um, a citizens' initiative down, which was very surprising. Now we see that they simply changed their strategy and they want to avoid public protests. So they think that pushing it through the constitutional tribunal is safer because politicians can uh, say it's not our fault. This is non-sovereign constitutional tribunal. And if they deem abortion case of fetal impairment as unconstitutional, we cannot do anything. We are before a series of elections, local, national, and elections to the European Parliament. There is a common idea that they are too afraid to do it now. So maybe after the elections, if they win, they will push the ban through the Constitutional Tribunal and not through the Parliament. Women have always had abortions. We will always have abortions. But if they are illegal, they tend to be a lot less safe. Abortion has always been illegal in Ireland. We have a constitution that is very dated and there were things in our constitution that meant that we could never progress at the rate that we purported to want to progress. And so the first thing that happened was marriage equality. After that referendum went through, the laser beam focus really seemed to be on abortion. There were a number of events that led up to that and one of them was the death of Savita Halepanavar. When Savita presented to a hospital in Galway, she was having a miscarriage. She asked the doctors to save her pregnancy. They said, you are having an incomplete miscarriage. There is nothing that we can do to save the pregnancy. She was miscarrying over four or five days when she was told that there was no chance of her pregnancy being saved. She said, well, then can I have an abortion? They, she was told, this is a Catholic country. We don't do that here. Now, we don't know if that was a nurse trying to explain to a woman from a different culture, I am very sorry that I can't intervene. It is against the law. Or if she was told as a foreign woman, I don't know what you think you guys do, but we don't do that here. And we don't know how it was said because Savita died and she got septicemia. It overwhelmed her body and she died in complete agony for absolutely no reason. Had she have been given the termination at the point at which she had presented to hospital with an incomplete miscarriage, which would have happened in almost every other country in Europe, she would have survived. A group of women across Ireland started planning and marching and the abortion rights campaign, they started holding the March for Choice. And it was very small um, the first year, but it doubled in size every single year. And the Together for Yes national campaign were the driving force behind the referendum. From the very first time we put up a crowdfunding link, we were expecting to get 50,000. We got like half a million, just like that. People were desperate to support because people wanted answers as to what you would do in hard cases. When the results came in, over 66% of the people of Ireland voted yes. There was momentary elation and we had done it and just the relief and then just a well of sadness because it meant that we could have done this years ago. We did not have to cater to this imaginary Middle Ireland. We were so worried because we had watched what had happened over in Poland and we had watched what had happened when women's rights were up for debate again. I think that when we won our referendum, we gave them a lot of hope, but I hope we also taught them a lot of lessons about where you should place yourself in it. As the Lands for Choice in North, I mean, we've always campaigned and worked really closely with our sisters in the Republic and again in Poland as well. 
What happened with the Republic and the referendum in the Republic is that it left Northern Ireland as an outlier. So we now have the most archaic abortion laws in the whole of Europe. We have a law called the 1861 Offences Against the Person Act. So it's over 150 years old. It was on the statute books before the light bulb was invented and Queen Victoria was on the throne. The momentum of the referendum has certainly given us new energy to continue to campaign and lobby. We helped campaign and lobby around the border counties. We had busloads of canvassers going down to help them deliver that referendum because we knew and we do know that they will come and help us deliver reproductive rights in the north as well. Vienna is still a very tolerant city, a very good city to live if you have the money. <laughs> it's getting more expensive. But the sentiments, the... when I was younger, maybe I didn't feel it as much. Maybe I wasn't involved as much. But I think it got worse in the last 10 years. Different sexual orientations are getting more afraid if they're not living in Vienna. The FPÖ, for example, has... As well as a racist agenda, they have a very sexist agenda. They have a, they call it pro-family, which is only a anti anti-homosexual agenda. If they rise because of racism, that still affects other minorities, other people. And the first time the far right, the FPÖ, went into coalition with the ÖVP, the conservatives, there were sanctions against Austria, but yet led to a huge sentiment against the EU in Austria. So they quickly backpedaled. We, as a, as a community of, of people who think that human rights is something that we should not abolish, uh, have to intervene if those things are, if those rights are being threatened. Then I think we have to intervene somehow. Even before my own coming out, I was interested in uh, activism, in LGBT activism. When I moved to, after my studies to, to Prague, by I guess coincidence, we met with few people who have been sharing with me the same kind of struggles. We were really sorry that we don't have a pride in Prague. <laughs> At that time it was uh, nine years ago and it really started from that. In 2010 I was Deputy Minister for Human Rights. At that time there was a discussion on the amendment to the law on uh, registered partnership and at that time Minister for Human Rights was kind of against it, uh, but he didn't want to say it really. And I felt guilty that I didn't push him to do the step. I heard that there is a Prague Pride starting to be organized, so I thought, okay, I'll help a little. I don't know, some legal stuff or governmental relations I could help. Then they fired me from the government, and Hannah said, well, just like the other time, maybe you should have coordinated. So I started to coordinate it, and I thought that I'll just do it for once, and then I'll come back to the civil service. I didn't think that I'm becoming my you know, LGBT career. <laughs> I think it's struggle to organize it every year. <laughs> Most of the team is uh, our volunteers. It's, it's really very demanding, but uh, lots of people really take it as their personal gift to the community. It's much bigger than just a little festival. It's more than just walking through the streets, especially when at that time President said that we are a bunch of deviants who have no rights to walk through the streets. It became clear that it's small. So since then, I'm stuck with Prague Pride. <laughs> it's really the, the biggest event where queer people can be visible, but also their family, friends, people who just want to live in a more open and respectful society. Visitors from the eastern part of Europe who come here because they can really be themselves. They don't have to be afraid to hold hands with their partners. They don't have to be afraid to kiss each other. And they really can feel safe, safe and secure here. The Czech Republic is so good right now. And their pride is awesome, but also like the whole attitude towards uh, homosexual people, it's completely different than here. I would like to call it a pride, but we don't have any rights at all. The only rights uh, for homosexual people are in a um, work uh, environment, and it's because the European Union put that there. So we are having equality for it, and for two years I'm the president of it. 18 years ago, 
um, it started as a free people, free, like free single people were doing equality parade. It's not only about LGBTQ people, this is the main core of course, but there is also women's rights, people with disabilities. Maybe right now it's easier, but I would say five, six years ago, it was super important to have allies with them. So this is my um, tattoo, it's, um, it means I'm a LGBT ally. My friend is scared to walk the street because he has, I don't know, paint nails or something. There's something wrong with, other, with, with our community, right? I decided that if I have um, a chance to work in academia and to work on sexuality, I think that I should more focus on the LGBTQ rights because there's still so much to do. I'm not a member of the community and I cannot understand fully how, what's their narrative, what's their history, but I'm trying to. I'm gonna, you know, stand beside them and say, hear them, hear them, they're also citizens of this country. In smaller cities, their prides, their marches are super violent. People are basically afraid to go. Mm, this year I was in Rezhov Pride. It's a um, really, really conservative city. The counter-protesters, they were shouting things I don't want to even say. And I saw these kids, you know, marching. Like, they were so proud carrying these rainbow flags that I really believe that the young people will make a change with that. Big flags and big smiles and, oh my God, I'm going to cry. <laughs> um, this year there were two girls, uh, I guess they were 16 years old, and they approached me during the uh, equality parade to say thank you that for this one day they can hold their hands on the street. There are months in, in my year that I'm sleeping only four hours per day, but it's worth it. It's worth to see these girls, these kids coming and saying, for this one day I could be myself. Environmental protection, it wasn't always the focus of my life. I was more of an activist for human rights, especially for LGBT rights here in Poland. Then I traveled to East Timor, where in this secluded, rich, pristine place, I saw that the change was happening. I saw it with my own eyes and I fell in love with nature, like, personally. Beovoja Forest is the last relatively pristine forest in lowland Europe. This is such a rich forest. It basically has the same meaning as Great Barrier Reef or Yellowstone, but it is not that well protected and it should be. It grows on a very fertile land, so in most cases it just got smashed down. We all cooperated together in stopping the logging as much as we could. We were really chaining ourselves in the middle of the forest to really huge logging machines. We used every single democratic and legal opportunity in Polish system to protect this forest without reaching out to the European Union because we knew there would be less hurt egos if we could deal with that in Poland, but just it just didn't work. We knew that we would be accused of being traitors to our country and all that, of course it happened. But we knew that without help of European Union, we would lose something that is not only Polish heritage. Every citizen of this planet owns Białowieża Forest and it was not to our Minister of Environment to destroy it. The European Court of Justice, the highest institution of law and justice in European Union, announced that Polish government needed to stop logging entirely, that they broke the law, that they need to amend what they did, that they need to prepare with a, a new plan, that they need to be supervised. And it was beautiful. It was beautiful.
we really cried, like open tears running on our faces. If any login happens, there are hefty fines. It really worked. These are very drastic measures that are not common at all. The Białowieża Forest case really set up some standards for European Union. A 12,000 year old uh, forest ship is going to get cut down for energy we don't need anymore, we don't want to use anymore. It makes us ill, it makes us sick. People, I think, are here because they want to have a future for their children with uh, clean air, clean water. Yes, it's uh, an old-fashioned way to produce the electricity, but our government, I think, wants to keep uh, this uh, company in position. We are protesting that this forest gets cut down from the energy company RWE, who is uh, digging for lignite in the biggest open coal pit in Europe. The protest is mainly civil disobedience. And right now, a huge, awesome support from the people of Germany. It's a fight we are fighting globally. We are fighting for system change, and we are against climate change. De la empresa de RBE. Son dueños de este bosque que se encuentra atrás de nosotros, que es un bosque bastante viejo, que tiene más que mil años de existir. Quieren cortarlo para extender su mina, para seguir produciendo energía barata. No puede ser que en el siglo XXI estamos cortando bosques para alimentar a una forma de producir energía que no es para, para nada sostenible. Había una persona que tenía un panel a la entrada que decía: um, hay alternativas para el carbón, pero no hay alternativas para la naturaleza. Y es muy cierto. Que yo vengo de un país tercermundista, vamos. Y se me hace muy interesante que esto esté pasando en un país como Alemania, ¿sabes? Que tienen tecnología de primer mundo, que tienen más este, innovaciones que nosotros y que siga pasando este tipo de situaciones. Hay procesos legales que están tratando de, de prohibir a la empresa de cortarlo, uh -huh. lo que no veo que va a funcionar, pero puede ser, puede ser una opción. Entonces, vamos a seguir yendo. Cada, cada, cada domingo van a hacer ahora una marcha. Vamos a seguir yendo y vamos a ver. The number one uh, step for humanity and the planet to change is that everyone, every single one, should understand the problem, how immense it is, and you start from your own life. I had an office job, I was in front of a computer all day, and I realized that this is not the life I want to live. I was not made to be in a corporate environment, frustrated all the time and stressed. We were like robots in a way. As soon as we came back to nature, everything started changing. We came across permaculture. We went to a permaculture design course. And those 12 days completely changed my point of view of life. With permaculture, everything started to have a meaning. And uh, we knew what we had to do. We are one, planet and us, we are just one. The more we cope for our own well-being, I think the more we help the planet. Because we, if we're looking for good, healthy, organic or natural grown food with ethics and uh, care, one helps the other. Now, after seven years, we see the garden and we cannot believe our eyes ourselves how much it grew and how much it's thriving. For me, the important thing here is that we love what we do. That's the most important ingredient here. And that's what people come here and what they see, they see is love in this place. I think what set things in motion was kind of unhappiness in the past life. An office job, quite stressful and yeah, not really fulfilling. Wondering, is this it, right? I think this is very common. I took my backpack and said, I'm gonna check these places out, go through Europe. I found Shenny, my wife, that is into this uh, project as well. And we kind of decided to go on together, keep traveling, keep finding these projects that we could learn. The last one we found was here in Greece and we just fell in love with this place, with the people, with our neighbors. It took us about 10 minutes to decide like, yeah, this is the place. We had our list. How does this piece of land that we started a small farm on, how is this going to look like? Coming here the first time, it was just like we had our checklist and we were just 
checking off. Yep. I think it's important for at least some people to start gearing down how many people can this planet support if everybody has this Western lifestyle with so much uptake of resources. The first farmer we visited, he said at some point, all of us, we have like 25 household slaves and they're not so visible anymore. Some of them are in third world countries slaving for us for minimum wages so that we can have this uh, comfortable uh, lifestyle. As soon as he said that to me, I, I started thinking, I was like, yeah, that's true. And I, I don't want to live like that. This lifestyle, I think, is important, at least for me, because I have that belief that imprint that we make, at least, it gets smaller by doing this. I'm not a big fan of nation states. I think the whole idea of nation states is quite young. It's not like we have always had these man-made borderlines. And it's really silly and irresponsible to think that our responsibility for nature, for environment and climate would be somehow limited inside these man-made borders. I think humans as species, they are really bad at trying to think what will come after 10 or 20 years. We are really good at thinking about next winter or next few years, but we are always failing when we try to look further to the future. I think that we are relying way too much on choices of individuals. We are talking about how a young person should be recycling their waste in a studio apartment in Helsinki when we actually should be changing our whole economies. We are talking about the acidification of oceans. We are talking about deforestation. We are talking about extreme weather conditions, droughts, floods, which will lead approximately 250 million people leaving their homes because of climate change by 2050. What I'm really worried about is that since 2015, since the migrant crisis, as we often say in Europe, started, we went completely nuts. And, and when it comes to 250 million people possibly starting to migrate around the world and possibly many of them heading towards Europe and European Union, we start to think how we can offer a better future for these people who are looking and seeking for safety. There's a lot to do and I personally, I don't even know where to start, but it feels a little bit hopeless right now. And I, I think the most hopeless thing is that we have all this knowledge and we know exactly what we need to do, but there's no political willpower right now. We need to talk about the coexistence of people and nature, how they change their nature, how they try to live in a rather wild and rather difficult uh, situation. The dunes, from the point of view of nature protection, is the biggest challenge for the national park. 70% of the national park land is covered with a forest. It's a huge number, and the forest now is dominant and we are losing dunes. Sand uh, grains is traveling, and they're traveling uh, thanks to the wind and thanks to the people to the lagoon, and they disappear. We have the history of the protection Coronian spit rather long. It started in 19th century. Humans, uh, they need to live here, so they need to decide how to protect the surrounding. In the Soviet time, it was made as uh, a landscape reserve and the National Park was founded here in 1991. And UNESCO World Heritage Park, it became in 2000, all uh, Coronian spit together with Lithuania and Russia side. It's really unique. In this part of Europe, in this part of Lithuania, the landscape is totally different from mainland. And you can see how fragile We all know about the challenges of the climate change globally. Here, as we know, the changes are the most rapid. We're kind of in the, the forefront. The Sami culture is linked to our home area. We need to safeguard the environment to also safeguard the Sami culture. We see a greening Arctic. High peaks of birch larva is killing the forests here. I can't find blueberries anymore where we used to pick blueberries. For reindeer, it means when you have milder winters, you have more frequent freezing and thawing. During winter, the reindeer would use a hoof to dig 
the snow to access the lichen. But if this is closed by ice crust, it will be harder for the small ones and the weaker ones to access the food. For me, that means that the areas that I would walk with my mom and she would tell all the stories, stories of how to find these places and how to read the nature, the connection to that land that you have been living on for so long is broken. Protecting the environment and protecting ecosystems and ensuring healthy and productive ecosystems is also a way of protecting Sami culture. Ja, våra baby. Mun mamma är äldre med rätt och mamma är mun lärna orron. Jag mun var ganska med det. I think one of the biggest challenges with engaging with the EU is that they don't realize how big EU is and how small the Sami people are. The Sami culture is a subsistence living. We're depending on what the nature can offer us. But of course we should also try to be part of the modern developed world, so to speak. But it's not always easy to make those two worlds meet and meet in balance. We cannot force states to take actions, but I think it's really important that we can show on the ground the effects it has. In global politics, it's a risk to lose ourselves in the global picture. And we need to, to also to speak of the, and to, to understand what, what happens on the ground. One of the great strengths I feel with the Sami community and the Sami society is that it is vibrant and it is alive and it is uh, adapting and changing as every living culture does. We are now here at the traditional market in Wonnebat, the Varangebotten. There's handicrafters from the Russian side, from Finnish side, from Swedish side, who are joining their Norwegian colleagues uh, at this market. But with that comes also a political challenge. It's a challenge for these small, small scale uh, producers to cross borders with their goods to sell at markets like this. And the Sami market is very small. Yakti like this, it's only Sami that use it. When you are a Sami handicrafter, producer, you're, if you can't cross the border, your market gets very limited. Small producers have to pay their customs on the border and then they have to declare what they have sold on the return. It takes ages before they get refunded. Or even the challenge to this market that they didn't even get it refunded. So they actually had to pay taxes or customs for goods that they didn't sell. The borders came here 200 years ago. The Sami have been living in this region for 10,000 years. So this is a very new development for us, that you have these borders and you have to show what you are bringing. Sami, we are one people, and the borders, the state borders, should not hinder our people in living as one people. It's not only what is seen from outside, the exotic details in our cultures that are preserved for the, for the rest of the world. The Sami culture, it's in the everyday life. It's for the Sami people. We feel the, the attention from the outside world. And now it's not only our home states, so to speak, the Nordic states and Russia. It's also states from all over the world and companies from all over the world. Living in this area, you cannot think about the borders so much because if you do, if you start thinking about borders and thinking of them as obstacles to your daily life, you will not survive here, and especially not as a reindeer herder. In order to survive here, we need to use the resources available, whether they are on the Norwegian side, the Swedish side, or the Finnish side. As the Arctic has become more interesting to outside actors, we have opened up a dialogue with several other states and NGOs, and then EU started to knock on the door. They started to develop Arctic policies and trying to find out how they should um, be able to uh, sit at the decision-making table. The Sami people is depending on natural resources, but once they become available to the whole of the EU, that creates some challenges. Especially when it comes to hunting and fishing, that is an important source of income for the Sami people, and has been that for time memorial. But when that is also offered to the rest of the European community as a consequence of the, the right of the freedom of movement. 
that to challenge the natural resources. More and more people want to come to Sápmi because they want to experience the last piece of wilderness in Europe. We're just facing the downside of an increased tourism. Nobody believed in Bakar or in Croatia that uh, Bakar will be a tourist town, but I did. Bakar was not hit by the war, but we had another problem. Forced industrialization in Yugoslavia almost destroyed our Bakar Bay. When I was a little girl, I imagined that uh, if somebody gave me a power to change something, uh, I will uh, put away all this industry and put this town on a tourism track. After the closure of Koksara, our main uh, factory, we managed to remove most of the industry from Bakar Bay and we were turning to tourism. We started in 2009. I came here to work alone with a very limited funds, but we started with small steps. Our buildings are renovated. Frankopan Castle, churches, our catacombs, Turkish house. Bakar was the biggest town in Croatia at the end of the 19th century. Many people left trace. Historical and cultural heritage is a key to preserve the local identity. That is why it's extremely important to transfer our knowledge and skills to our next generations. Bakar was in isolation, tourist isolation for many decades. We started from ground zero. That is not a drum bag, but it is chance to be a sustainable uh, tourism destination because we are building it from the beginning. We can build the optimum number of tourists we want to uh, draw to our city. We still have a lot of work, but I think we are on the right track to remove the stigma of an industrial town and to become a beautiful coastal town. We really felt the need to balance between the mass tourism and our story, promoting the sustainable tourism and helping local people in uh, safeguarding their cultural heritage and have a living out of it. It all started with a group of enthusiasts from uh, the local community that wanted to safeguard this traditional uh, boat building because we had a lot of batanas, which is a very simple boat for shallow waters. This boat was so important for the local families. But since the 90s, the harbor was full, but of plastic boats, new type of boats that are not really linked to any local tradition. So they started a museum, but not really. Something really living that could help local communities continue the practice. Without this project, not only the physical boat, the material, heritage would disappear, but the skills. Different cultures merge, I would say, in Ruvin. It has a really strong Italian minority, but also the local population speak the Istriot language. And the other part is the Slavic influence that came mostly after World War II. It's really good to, to talk about it, to see the relationships, to see the exchanges that came out of the migrations that happened. And Batana really tries to reflect all the diversity that is present with the focus, of course, on the maritime and cultural heritage. It is fine to change because culture always changes. As we see, the, we don't need anymore the, the small boat for fishing, but maybe we need it for something else. So the meaning and the skill is here, but the function maybe will change and it is good to reflect upon it. The first ever band of uh, Chinook the Young Song of the Pipe Band started in uh, Kenya, Africa, then it was London, then it was Bolton, us, then the USA, and now there's a band in India as well, where we all originate from. We've conquered Bolton, shall I say, we've been in the news, we've had interviews with BBC. From that, people from around the world have seen us, and then they've got in touch with us to come in and take part in uh, their parades. 
we have a Mackenzie kilt and a Mackenzie plaid. And then we also wear a badge of our Good Day European Swami Rapper. We play traditional Scottish songs and we also play traditional Indian and our Hindu songs. Personally, every job interview I've been for, I've been asked about the band. And my band topic has been actually larger than the actual job I've gone for, so it's helped me in my own career as well. It's good, fun and games on the side, but when you're actually playing in the band, it's discipline, self-control. By joining the band, it built up my confidence of playing in front of people. One of the most proud moments I've had, and I can say that these lads have done us all proud, is when we played in front of our uh, Narendra Modi, our Indian Prime Minister. And at that time, the current Prime Minister was David Cameron. And we did a welcome for Modi to come to the UK and have that link with the India and UK together. And it's like a uniqueness that we have, that we try to bring different cultures, different communities and uh, different types of people together, no matter what background, with music. So music connects everything. El flamenco realmente tiene influencias ya conocidas que se sepa desde la época de los romanos. Existían unas bailarinas que eran la escuela de gaditanas y que bailaban sobre tablitas. En fin, ahí empieza ya un poco. Y luego tenemos influencias también, por ejemplo, de, del sur de América, norte de África, de la India. Sobre todo fueron ocho siglos de dominación árabe aquí en el sur de de Andalucía, entonces todo eso, eh, nuestros cantes populares, con, con, con esa combinación, digamos que es como una bomba, es fuego, ¿no? Yo empecé con nueve añitos, aquí lo, lo normal es que empecemos en, en la escuela y empezamos poco a poco a, a aprender el hermano sevillano, luego empieza con baile festero, bulería, tangos, pero nunca se termina de aprender, nunca se termina de aprender. Bajo mi punto de vista, el flamenco es una forma de, una forma de vida. Cada compañero, cada amigo, cada... Mmm, tiene una forma de, 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 de sentir, ¿no? Entonces, con lo cual, eh, el reflejo, lo que se ve fuera, es, es ella misma, ¿no? Te desnudas, te desnudas el alma. <risa> A mí me llena muchísimo. Me llena mucho el poder transmitir lo que yo siento a través del de, de, de flamenco, ¿no? que, que forma parte de, de, de mi vida, ¿no? en mi, mi día a día. ¿no? Muzeus yra įkurtas 66 metais, tai prieš gerą 50 metį. Ir muzeus plotas yra pagalo didelis, beveik 200 hektarų. Ekspozicijoje turime apie pusantro šimto pastatų. Aišku, pagrindas, kas muzejui yra eksponuojama, tai liaudės architektūra, buitis, 19 amžiaus pabaigos, 20 pradžios. Žinoma, žmonės turėjo įdėti begalę jėgų, pastangų, meilės, kad tas muziejus čia atsirastų, kad sukurtų tas ekspozicijas. Pastatai yra sugrupuoti, sujungti į kaimus kai kurie. Kai kurie yra vienkiemiai, na ir galima matyti ne tik gyvenamą į namą, bet ir visus ūkinius pastatus. Manau, kad būtent šita vieta, Lietuvos Liaudės Buitės muziejus, tai yra pati geriausia vieta, kur žmonės gali susipažinti su savo praeitim. Kiekvienas žmogus neatsiradės iš niekur. Visi mes ateiname iš kažkur, tai visi turime savo praeitį. Ir čia gali susidurti, su, tiesiog pamatyti visus penkis etnografinius regionus. Tuo žmonės įsivaizduoti savo mintyse, kurie kūrė tą Lietuvą, kurie saugojo papročius, tradicijas. Tik jų dėka mes esam tokie, kokie esame dabar. Be praeities negali būti ateities ir be abejo kiekvienas tikras lietuvis turi žinoti savo praeitį, savo šaknis. Viena iš muziejaus misijų yra saugoti papročius, tradicijas ir perduoti jas ateities kartom. Kai kurie galbūt papročiai tradicijos nyksta, nes Lietuva jau nebėra tokia agrarinė šalis, kokia buvo anksčiau. 
kai kurie nebetenka prasmės, bet mūsų muziejoje visgi bandom išsaugoti tos papročios, tradicijos, kad jie visiškai nenunyktų. Didžiausias apdovanojimas tikriausiai yra dirbti šitame muziejoje tai galimybė, bendrauti su žmonėms, pasakoti jiems ir ką mes geriausiai iš to gaunam, tai žmonių švytinčios akis, jų rašome atsiliepimai, padėkos mums, tai turbūt nieko nėra svarbiau dirbant savo darbą. Ir kai ateini prie sodybos su žmonėm ir ypatingai vyresnio amžiaus išeiviais, kai matai, kad jie stovi prie sodybos ir jūs kruostais rieda ašaros, tai tikriausiai pats didžiausias apdovanojimas, koks tai gali būti šiame muziejoje. Visiting the museum as a culture in Europe. I work in the Multaka project. It started the 8th of 2015 because in that time there were so many people arrived to Germany from Iraq and Syria. We start to give them something, to offer from them something from our work in the museum. The project is really important for the newcomer because we would like to offer them something like hope in Germany, in the museum. We have so many objects as come from Iraq and Syria and they feel at home for a moment. People start to discuss where they come from, why the objects are here, how they feel with the objects. They say that's come from my city or I see that for the first time in my life. We have so many topics are discussed in our tours, especially in the German History Museum because as you know, the cities in Iraq and Syria and Mosul or in Aleppo, it's really destroyed. And the same picture of destroying was Berlin in the Second World War. Our guides in the German History Museum start to give some hope for them because if something destroyed, it's never end. You can't start and rebuild everything again. Our tools is focused on dialogue. We would like to make a discussion between us, between the guide and the visitors, and start the tour in that way. We like to let them speak, to let them share their knowledge. Refugees walk in the German museum and share the information about the German history, about the European history, about the culture, where they come from, and it was really important to show the people what we can do. For refugees, it is extremely difficult to get into contact with locals. At the same time, for locals, it's also very difficult to get into contact with refugees. And what we do in our workshops is we meet for three days or 15 to 20 hours with a group of people from 15 to 20. And we discuss fundamental values like democracy, freedom, autonomy, emancipation, women's rights, homosexuality, identity, respect, tolerance. We try to, to find out together, mainly by asking questions. So it's not what we call in Germany frontal unterricht. We do not explain people what the right answer is. We try to find together what possible answers could be. Integration is not something that you can accomplish within a couple of months. You need programs that take years. And it's not just uh, that we need to integrate uh, refugees. We also need to integrate many citizens from our own uh, societies. Refugees have a reason to be a refugee. They fled from countries that most of the time are not democracies, do not have freedom, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, uh, freedom of association. So they had the reason to think about these values. And when we discuss these values with uh, refugees, they often have uh, pretty good answers. European citizens are often overwhelmed by the whole uh, question. They are like fish in water. They never ask themselves, what is this water? It's sometimes difficult to recruit people. They uh, also have bad experiences, of course, uh, to talk about politics and to, to express opinions. We in our Western societies also do not talk much about politics anymore, certainly not with other people of which we suspect uh, that they might have different opinions. But when we have sit together for a couple of days, they always want to do it again. Uh, it always was fun.
we wanted to learn more and to try to find out more and to reach out to children and youth that had come unaccompanied to Sweden and kind of uh, disappeared from the system. It's very difficult to say how, how many in Stockholm right now, I don't think, I don't know if anyone knows. And we, of course, in this project, we don't meet everyone. But so far, I th we have met more than 200. It has become um, more polarized in Sweden. On, on one hand, you have people who maybe more and more see immigrants as a burden than as a resource. But on the other hand, in our organization, in Stockholm City Mission, we see a lot of engaged uh, people really welcoming and trying to support the people coming, seeking for asylum in Sweden. Most of them are, are, are in a very, very vulnerable situation right now and a very high risk of exploitation in, in many different ways. 20 years ago, there was a first crisis with uh, the Kurdish people who came in Greece. I was very touched by uh, their situation. That was the start of uh, me being interested in uh, the refugee issue. After, I was involved in, uh, as a volunteer in a school where I was a teacher. Uh, I was teaching Greek to refugees. They don't have the organizations to give them money, to provide them with uh, some goods and to give them, let's say, the basic, the mobile, to communicate with their families, uh, which is a basic need. It's a growing problem in Greece now. But the worst of all is that we have a lot of Greek people or uh, other European people who come in Greece uh, who pays uh, minors mostly between 14 and uh, 17 years old to have sex with them. It's, it's tragical because imagine you are a Syrian boy, let's say, you left the war, you came here for a better future, and uh, your future is that. The big uh, refugees uh, groups starting to come at summer of 2015. At the start of that movement, the society reaction, it was very, very nice. They're trying to help the refugees, they're trying to be there with the refugees, they're trying to give them their home, their food, everything. But after that, starting a new road, because people think that, okay, the state can control that, uh, the foundation can control that, the European Union can give money for that, everybody will leave uh, in three, six months. But the problem is they don't have the choice to spread them in the European Union. The second problem that comes after that is that they keep thousands of people in places that nobody can exist. There are places that they build that under an emergency, they can hold uh, only 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 people, but now they keep there 7,000 people. So uh, we have a lot of rebellions, a lot of anger from the refugees and also from the society back to the refugees. If the authorities, of course, they don't give you a lot of things, they the problem come back to you as a worker, as a volunteer, because uh, you are limited in your job. You have limits, you cannot pass the limits. Uh, it's not your fault. But the refugee will not understand that, especially me that I have teenagers. They don't understand, they say, why? I cannot understand why they don't give me the ID. I have passed through the war. Uh, <laughs> so simple. Everything getting more and more difficult because uh, the authorities don't give money for the shelters. So you have a lot of children that uh, going around to the streets. They don't giving a lot of uh, money for the food to the shelters. So you have the problem that you have some kids in the shelters, but 
uh, nobody can provide them full protection uh, for having for living their lives there. So you come to a point that you feel that uh, sometimes your job is to do nothing. It's a lot of nights that you coming back to home and you know that you have children that are staying out in the streets or you to have um, children that are staying on the jail, protected jail. And you go to your home and he's not going to his home or her home. My main role is to keep things going here. Yeah. And that involves keeping the food shops going, keep them stocked, go to all the local produce stores that we collect from, to give the people that are working with me jobs to do, because there's so much to do. We've just sorted out local produce, a local fruit and veg man to come by every day and deliver, which is, it takes a weight off my shoulder. Financial funding is the most important thing. Um, volunteers are needed, but it's the, it's the funding that we really need. Without that, we couldn't buy any of this and we couldn't give basic needs to people. We wouldn't be able to provide any of it. We, we just had a volunteer here that we were at this camp up in the north near Albania and she was appalled at how little these children had. And so she put a, a post up on Facebook saying, these children have nothing, give what you can. But a lot of people were also thinking about donating kids toys and these things and that's not, that's not what we need. We need money to then put back into the Greek system. We need money to keep things going, like even just paying for the petrol for one of the vans to take this food somewhere. Like, we need that money to keep this going. There's a big misconception about, oh, we have some things that we can send there. That's really good, but we can also buy these things here in Greece. And Greece has been largely looked over by the EU. This crisis has taken a lot away from them. And so anything that we can do to help them stay afloat is actually important. Ao longo da história, sempre houve fluxos de, de refugiados, pessoas em movimento. Há muitos anos que, que vínhamos a ter esta problemática dos refugiados sobre o mar Mediterrâneo. E, e o que é certo é que não se prestou muita atenção sobre isso. Só os países que estavam mais afetados, como a Grécia e a Itália, é que tinham a noção da realidade. E o que é certo é que a União Europeia não se tem comprometido relativamente às diretrizes que se comprometeu na sua criação. E o que é certo é que nenhum ser humano é ilegal. É surreal. Numa União Europeia que supostamente somos pelos direitos humanos, somos pelo, pelo direito de igualdade, tratarmos assim quem, quem necessita e quem precisa de ajuda. Relativamente aos direitos humanos, o que são os direitos humanos? A maior parte das pessoas não sabe o que são direitos humanos. E quando se questiona sobre isso, as pessoas ficam um bocado confusas, mas é importante explicar porque elas, ao saberem sobre o que é os direitos humanos, o que são os seus direitos, têm capacidade para poder defendê-los. E passa por, por ter direito à casa, à educação, à saúde, etc, etc. Mas, para mim, um dos direitos mais fundamentais que, que, que existem é a liberdade de expressão. Porque com a liberdade de expressão eu tenho poder para me exprimir, para reivindicar, para defender aquilo que eu acredito aquilo que é fundamental uh, na, uh, na minha vida e na vida das pessoas que estão à minha volta. É importante as pessoas uh, terem noção que a liberdade de expressão é, o, é dos mais preciosos bens que nós temos e que temos que preservá-lo. E se nós avaliarmos, por exemplo, um país, se ele é democrático ou não, um dos principais pilares é a liberdade de expressão.
e para mim é, é das coisas mais fundamentais. Tanto a liberdade de expressão de se eu quiser falar o que eu quiser e como eu quiser, como, por exemplo, a liberdade de expressão da imprensa, dos, tel dos telejornais, dos jornais, das, das comunidades, das associações que nós temos. E esse é, o, é dos direitos mais fundamentais e que eu acho mais preciosos e que temos que lidar diariamente. Se você olhar o que está acontecendo na Hungria ou em alguns países Eastern European states, onde você vê like, heads of states ou prominentes politicians actually threatening journalists publicly or condemning or speaking badly about certain journalists, about certain media or about journalism or media as a whole. Uh, in Slovenia, um, a former prime minister was attacking us on Twitter. Those behaviors get f uh, free pass too often. This is a very worrying trend because it's starting to look like that in Europe more and more is, is allowed in, in regard to throwing insults at, at journalists. I mean, it's okay to criticize. I mean, we should also, we don't make mistakes and we can be criticized, but in an appropriate way, not as like branding us as like a enemies of the state or even something worse. Reporters Without Borders has noticed a deterioration of the climate of press freedom throughout Europe in the past two, three, four years. A trend that was going on in the world has spread into Europe. It's happening everywhere. The uh, Czech president Miloš Zeman came at a press conference with a fake uh, Kalashnikov aimed at telling journalists the lack of respect he has. It's something that uh, we've seen in Croatia, it's something we've seen in Bulgaria, where journalists are constantly attacked. It's something also that we saw in Italy with the uh, Five Star Movement, something we saw during the referendum in Spain and also in France. The fact that political leaders have attacked journalists and have used a rhetoric that is very anti-journalistic has probably contributed to the number of attacks we've seen. When the assassination happened on October the 16th, 2017, I was actually teaching her nephew, I know through theatre, and he also teaches at my place. And we'd been having a laugh at lunchtime. He went off, he finished before I did. I went to teach a class, I came out, it was half, um, just after three or four. Another teacher came out and said to me, have you heard they've got Daphne? And my first thought was, Jesus, she was the obvious target. And they've got her, they've got her. She exposed the corruption going on in this country till the day she died, literally. And she was the obvious target. If you're going to kill someone in Malta, she's the one. And they did. They did. I just could not take it in. What I couldn't take in, in addition, which just intensified, it was a response here. You had a big crowd of people going, she deserved it. She said cruel things about people. Well, she did say nasty. She said nasty things, so she deserves to be assassinated. She published hard journalism. She published stories which we needed to hear. People are scared to speak because they want to find a job. I'm having problems finding a job. I'm finishing university this year. And people often tell me, yes, yes, we'd love to hire you, but stop what you're doing actively. People here get married around 24, 25, maybe slightly older now. And you're told not you can't get the job that you wanted because you've spoken out. You prefer not to speak out, get the job, keep your head down, look forward, take care of yourself, the others can take care of themselves. People want to speak out, but they're scared. And I get these messages every day, every week. I want to say this, but I'm worried. The ex-head of the General Union of Workers, who's a consultant to the government, called us prostitutes publicly, publicly. On the day of the funeral of Daphne Caruana Galizia, somebody on Facebook posted a picture, a painting by Goya, a witch being burnt by witches. This is the 21st century. And yet in this place, which is supposedly in Europe and supposedly, you know, runs itself on European ethics of some kind, the mentality is, is medieval. I mean, it's oozing with abnormality. Everything you think is normal is not happening here. The kind of normal response to the brutal assassination of a woman and a journalist, and a wife, and a mother, and a sister, and a daughter. The obvious gut reaction, which is that is shocking and terrific. Here, that didn't happen. 18 countries, 45 journalists, the largest newspapers on the planet, 
headlines, front pages, printed, online, thousands and thousands of euros and dollars put into research. And you know what our government said? They're trying to blacken our name. It's not true. They're looking for the truth. They're looking for what actually happened. Why is this actually happening? As long as political leaders use this kind of rhetoric, uh, it gives an idea that journalists should not be respected and they could be attacked. And so why, if a political leader attack a journalist, why wouldn't you, as a citizen, be able to do the same? Of course, we have to deplore the deaths of three journalists in the region, Daphne Carana Galizia in uh, Malta on uh, October 16, 2017, then the deaths of a young journalist, Jan Kuciak, in Slovakia on the 21st of February 2018, and then the deaths of uh, Victoria Marinova, a Bulgarian journalist, on October 6, 2018. Something completely unseen uh, that gives an idea of the change in the climate uh, of uh, press freedom in the region. In Malta, we deplore the fact that the um, authorities are not doing enough to support the journalists, are not condemning this murder enough, are not doing enough uh, to conduct a deep investigation into the murder. We welcome some new steps in Slovakia, but it took some time before the government really <coughs> condemned the murder of this young journalist and also uh, put into effect some rules. A journalist was murdered in Slovakia. His name was Jan Kuciak. Uh, he was murdered in his house in Velka Macha together with his fiance, Martina Kushnirova. He was 27 years old, same as me. And I don't think he would remember me, but I did remember him because I used to work with him. I did follow him afterwards, uh, his work when he was uncovering the corruption scandals connected to the political elites in Slovakia. And I was not surprised that he became uh, such a good journalist. He was always a very, very strong, analytically thinking, critically thinking investigator. There was a huge uproar after he was murdered. I attended almost all of the protests that followed. This was a huge wake-up call and that's why I'm a little bit optimistic that we will make it this time again, that we will not go the Hungarian way, even though we are just a small country surrounded by autocracies right now. The civil society in Slovakia actually woke up just as it woke up in 1998, it woke up in 2018 because this was a wake-up call. So the first step is, of course, to have the local government act and condemn what's going on on the ground. The second thing is that we demand the European institution to support us and also to bring the 28 members of the EU to respect what they signed for when they entered the European Union. When it comes to how the EU deals with member states that undermine its norms and values. I think that there's two ways that the EU can deal with this. One idea that's been mentioned would be that the budgetary payments to EU countries would be conditional on keeping up the norms of the rule of law and, and if any of these values are broken that the money will be withheld. All I think that does will make the EU less popular in these countries because that affects people who need this funding. That will galvanise them and will galvanise the leaders to say, look, the EU is withholding money because we're just trying to do what we want to do. And I think that that's really dangerous. The other mechanism that's been talked about at the moment is what's commonly known as the Article 7 procedure, which is where a member state's voting rights will be suspended if they are seen to not be holding up the EU's values. And I think that this is actually a way that the EU should be pursuing. The European Commission intends to link subsidies to the adherence to the rule of law and the EU values. And there are supporters and opponents of the solution, of course. Therefore, it's the more so important that they uh, justify this decision, the Polish society.
because at the same time, uh, the government has this narrative of violating our autonomy and interfering in our internal affairs and so on. So it's necessary that the European Union explains it in details in a way that every person could understand it. The European Union is essentially an incomplete project because we have built some institutions, but the powers they have and the resources they have to implement these policies are very often very, very limited. And at the moment, there is a growing gap between uh, what the European Union is expected to do and what the European Union can actually deliver. And this gap between ideals and reality is becoming more and more visible to citizens. These shortcomings are real. What's the way to address them? There is the view of uh, the nationalists and populists that say to rebring power within national uh, borders in the hands of national politicians and within the dynamics of national uh, democracy. Take control back. We believe this is an illusion. It's an illusion in, in today's world to control your prosperity, the level of employment, the level of investment in your country only at national level. It's an illusion to control issues from climate change to the industrial revolution to the use of private data by digital multinational at national level. It won't happen, it won't happen. The question is, is there an alternative? The alternative that the European Union offers today appears weak. We believe that concerns of the citizens on the shortcomings of the European Union are real, and the answer of the European Union of just defending the status quo is not sufficient. And either the European Union, or we as Europeans together, are able to build a European Union that is stronger, has more power, has more resources to deliver in the fields that matter to citizens, either we are able to increase what the European Union can do or we will lose the citizens. National politicians, on the one hand, work in Brussels as part of the Brussels elite, but then they go back and they speak about the European Union as opposition, as Brussels being far away. Two things the European Union should do, in my view, in order to improve their connection with citizens. And the first one is to really make an even higher effort in clearly communicating where it has powers and where it represents citizens. The European Parliament should say here, in external relations, in negotiations with Canada, with the US, with Singapore, with Japan, we can really represent your interests in a very different way than your national parliaments. And the second part would be the European Union must find a way of improving the behavior of national politicians. If they vote in favor, if they speak in favor, if they agree to something or at least not oppose it in the council, that they must be tracked down if they portray it as a Brussels imposed decision at home. People perceive the European Union to be the other. As long as we can't address that feeling, the system as it exists at the moment is unstable. People voted leave in Scotland as they did in the rest of the United Kingdom for the same reason that people voted to leave the United Kingdom in 2014. A fear of that you're not getting the best out of life, that things could be better if. Europe had been blamed for a lot of social problems. Migration had been blamed for unemployment levels or poverty. The integrity of the whole of the United Kingdom is put under immense strain by Brexit, and particularly around the Irish border, the possibility of a hard border and the return to the Troubles may actually see a referendum for unification of the island of Ireland. So too might it be for Scotland as well. I hope that's not the case, but this is greater strain than I can ever remember. There is always a danger of taking peace for granted. The confrontations and the bloodshed, the bombings, the killings, almost 4,000 people killed. Nobody expected that. In the early 20th century, the island of Ireland was divided between the Irish Free State, later Irish Republic, and the six counties of Northern Ireland, which still remains as, as part of the United Kingdom. At the end of the 1960s, we have civil rights movement here, which is essentially an Irish nationalist movement. And that leads in to what we refer to as the Troubles, an armed insurgency. In 1998, following an IRA ceasefire, the major 
political parties came to an agreement, what we call the Good Friday Agreement, which allowed for power sharing between nationalists and unionists in Northern Ireland. The border is a hugely emotive issue for Irish nationalists because in the early 20th century, the island was partitioned between North and South. The European Union framework ensured that there was virtually no border, no border markings of any significance between North and South on this island. We've had 20 years of relative peace. Northern Ireland is so different to what it was. Having said that, the two communities are as polarised as ever. Any attempt to reimpose a border will resuscitate all kinds of anger. The big question there, of course, is might this spill over into armed conflict of the kind we saw in the 1970s, 1980s and on into the 1990s? I live in South Armagh, close to the border with the Republic of Ireland. Growing up here, you know, I was 19 when the it was the first IRA ceasefire. This was a very militarised place. A few metres from where we're standing, I could have shown you five British Army watchtowers. You had 24 hour, almost a day helicopter activity because they had to fly to the bases and to the watchtowers. They, they didn't bring vehicles into this area. So it was a, a tough place growing up. We've came through the peace process with huge European support through the Peace and Reconciliation Programme. The investment has been brought into these communities that we never, ever, ever had. We live in a very peaceful place. Brexit is an anathema to us. The campaign in the UK, which was a, mostly focused around immigration, is something that we here living in Ireland can't even begin to have any reality with. Um, I remember very well the night of the vote. I was here calving a cow. I went home shortly after 1am and put on the TV and Sunderland were the first constituency to declare. And I was shocked to think that a, an area that's dependent on Japanese car manufacturers who export tens of thousands of cars to the European continent, that if that constituency voted leave, I knew when I would wake up in the morning that it was going to be a leave, a leave vote. We were getting some abuse early on, maybe from within unionism, who were opposed to what we were saying. But that has dropped probably by 90 odd percent because there's been a shift even in unionism thinking around Brexit. People have stopped me on the street, unionists that, I, that are strangers to me, and have said, I'm sorry that I voted leave. We were lied to, and had we had the opportunity to vote again, we would vote to remain. The border was a very fluid border, as you'll see if you've ever crossed it. Kinship ties, cultural ties, linguistic ties. That's always been there. Gibraltar is a multicultural society, a multi-faith society. People still come to Gibraltar because of opportunities for work, because of the climate, because of its position. It means that they can travel around Europe very easily. Gibraltar is informed by this element of, of uh, a Mediterranean um, diaspora, I'd say. But then at the same time, the Britishness element in Gibraltar is very strong and very powerful. To understand the results of the Brexit referendum and to understand Gibraltar's affinity clearly with Europe, we are part of Europe, and, and Gibraltar's strong bond with the UK, we do have to go back in history. Gibraltar becomes British in 1713 with the signing of the Treaty of Utrecht, and to this day Gibraltar remains a British territory. Clearly there's a reversionary clause which says, should Great Britain no longer wish to hold on to Gibraltar, Gibraltar should revert to Spain. But even though that reversionary clause has never been triggered, Spain has continued to try to regain Gibraltar, which led to a referendum in 1967, where Britain posed the question to Gibraltarians whether or not 
they wish to remain British or whether they wish to become Spanish. And the result was 99 or 98 point something percent that Gibraltarians wish to remain British. And a few weeks after, in 1969, once the new constitution for Gibraltar is released, Spain closes its border with Gibraltar. It reopened, ironically enough, in 1982, and then fully in 1985, because that was one of the prerequisites for Spain entering Europe at that point. There was a second referendum, by the way, in 2002, over a joint sovereignty deal, and the results were that, of course, Gibraltar would in no way consider any joint sovereignty. And the other referendum is now the, the Brexit referendum on whether or not to remain in Europe. Gibraltar overwhelmingly again opted to remain in Europe. But Gibraltar's bond with the UK runs so deep that Gibraltar is exiting with the UK. It's a difficult one for Gibraltar because Gibraltar is very small. It needs a fluid border. But not only that, it appreciates having the affinity that it does with the, the immediate Spanish hinterland because this is a relationship that has prevailed over hundreds of years. People like each other. People are very similar in their outlook. Why can't Gibraltar remain being Gibraltar and continue having this good relationship with Europe and with Spain without having everything else dragged into it? The Remain campaign during the referendum was pathetic. It was totally passionless, it was totally soulless, it was fact-based. We had all these career politicians that people don't trust. And then in contrast to that, we had Boris Johnson, this charismatic uh, politician turning up with this big red bus with this really enticing £350 million for the NHS lie on the side. But people believed it. I wasn't involved in the Remain campaign before the referendum. I just thought, what a load of nonsense. Who would vote for that? How wrong was I? It just kicked me into action overnight. I just turned into this political activist. It's kind of snowballed into something that's overtaken my life. <laughs> Before the referendum, people, they wouldn't wear EU flag clothing. They wouldn't go out in the streets and wave EU flags. They wouldn't promote Europe on street stalls like we do now. The only things we were hearing was Brexit, Brexit, Brexit. Brexit means Brexit. Red, white and blue Brexit. There was nobody talking about stopping Brexit. I think it's a case of you don't know what you've got until it's gone. Scotland was taken out of the EU in the Brexit vote against its will because it, there was a significant majority for Remain in Scotland. The day after the result, we started to see the Leave prospectus evaporate. We aren't getting the £350 million that was pledged on the side of a bus. We see buyer's regret. I thought, well, I'll give them a chance to see if they can do it. And, um, and I've never regretted anything more in my life. I just felt the, the Remain campaign was very negative. They weren't, they, they weren't citing really any benefits. It was just, you better stay with Remain or it's going to be terrible. It's quite negative. And the Leave campaign was saying we could have everything we've got now and more. So more trade, more services. The Leave campaign was very imaginative and optimistic about what the future could bring. The only problem is that they weren't constrained by the need to tell the truth. And I think, um, I think many of us uh, uh, kind of went for that optimistic vision of the future, which wasn't necessarily based on, on the truth. It was based on conjecture of, of um, politicians who uh, uh, had their own motivations. There are many, many good things about our membership of the EU, and those things need to be advertised. And no, it's not perfect, but it's definitely better than the alternative. Then we were Aaron Wynn, we can have a seed and seed conway, cockled cumbri, a good dog of a son for the bubble or cockled head you, eating than the money when it helped play by the bubble at Katinda Brexit terminal. We have to understand why the people of Wales voted to leave the European Union. Uh, we have a very weak media in Wales and we tend to go with England on a lot of things because we only listen to English radio, English TV stations, we only get English newspapers. But on Brexit Day, we didn't go to the polls on Welsh issues. 
we went on British issues. Uh, so that is a huge problem, and that's something we need to face in Wales. You know, a lot of our roads, a lot of our in infrastructure um, is reliant on European funding. So if we had to lose that, it's a you know a big, massive blow. Our beef, for example, is sold to France, to Spain, to Italy. Uh, and if, if we lose access to the single market, it could decimate that economy. John Simpson living in the UK. I didn't see coming that our rights would be threatened so much. We are kind of at the core of Europe, really, because we exercise these rights. And that is why I think we should not be the biggest victims of Brexit, which at the moment would for both groups be the case. Yeah. I'm a British yeah. citizen living in the Netherlands. Brexit is personal. It's not about trade or money. No, it's about people. For me, being a European citizen means that uh, I, I, made, I made a choice to move abroad. I had that right to do. And it means freedom. It just means freedom to build a life somewhere else. Uh, my life is no different to most people's lives here. It's a struggle. And um, I just have to do it in a different language. For a lot of people on my side of the argument, they get angry over it. And I just, I just feel this deep sense of sadness, this idea that a fundamental disconnect from reality has taken place, where Britain thinks that it is in some way better and different to its European partners. And I don't think that you know, any of them are, are better or worse than any others. I think we're all in this together. You know, we have strong and long ties with Europe for good reasons. They share our values. They share our opinions on many things. And I think this, this idea that we can just suddenly go our own way is a monumentally sad way to see the world, that we don't need these people who we've had so much history with, who we've allied together with to beat totalitarianism. To me, I, I just, I get sad when I think about it. There's a perception at the moment, really, that to be democratic means to do what the majority says. You hear it in the UK, the will of the people. The people have spoken because 52%. But really, democracy has to be much more complicated than that because there are another 48% of people in that case, and their views have to be held as well. And what a lot of countries in the EU are doing is purposefully undermining those people and reducing the rights of minorities, reducing the rights of the press, of the judicial um, institutions, which are all fundamental to the overall idea of democracy. It is not going well for Brexit. I mean, the negotiations are a disaster. The UK has no idea what it's going to do, and all the lies that the pro-leave pro campaign uh, spouted about how easy it was going to be, how everything was going to be fine, blah, blah. From Donald Trump to Brexit for all of 2016, as someone with a, a background in politics, I've been screaming from the rooftops, trying to tell friends to take this seriously. We look for any excuse to kind of disengage. I think Brexit really shows the, the danger of that. But on another factor, I think it shows the danger of disinformation. The entire Brexit campaign was based on a series of lies, I mean, outright lies. Implanting a lie in someone's mind is incredibly easy, right? Just throwing out a news article which says, you know, could this be true? And this puts in that thought, huh, yeah, maybe that's true. But disproving that is immensely difficult. Part of why people are prone to believe a lot of propaganda and disinformation about the European Union, all these nonsense about how European Union is big bad Brussels that is just dictating us and it's a, it's actually like a the European dictatorship blah 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 why they believe in that is because nobody ever taught them how European Union works so when people don't understand what Europe is they can't value it hablan de Italia como una tierra prometida por el populismo Italia es un país en que el populismo, digamos, se había afianzado ya a partir al menos de principios de los años 90, cuando Silvio Berlusconi llega por primera vez al gobierno de Italia. Y luego hemos tenido más recientemente la experiencia del Movimiento Cinco Estrellas, actualmente en el gobierno con la nueva liga lepenizada nacionalista de Matteo Salvini. El líder político del Movimiento Cinco Estrellas, Luigi Mayo, decidió encontrarse, reunirse en Francia con algunos dirigentes de los chalecos amarillos. El mismo Di Mayo, así como otros líderes de los Cinco Estrellas y el mismo Matteo Salvini, han hecho declaraciones en esos mismos días a favor de la protesta de los chalecos amarillos, animándoles a continuar la lucha a favor de una mayor democracia, sin explicar más bien qué tipo de democracia era.
¿Cuáles han sido las consecuencias? Evidentemente una decisión eh, excepcional por parte del gobierno francés de retirar por unos días su embajador en Roma y además pedir a la embajadora italiana en Francia una reunión. La última vez que el embajador francés había sido llamado por París para que abandonase Roma había pasado en 1940 cuando Mussolini declaró guerra a Francia aliándose con Hitler. Evidentemente este acontecimiento no es muy positivo y más bien no nos hace pensar en un futuro uh, positivo. Creo que uno de los mayores problemas de la Unión Europea ha sido uh, la manera en que se ha llevado adelante la, el proyecto de la Unión Europea. Una unión que ha sido en primer lugar monetaria y económica y solo en una segunda etapa se habría convertido en una unión política. Errores se han hecho muchos. Un error que yo creo que ha sido muy importante ha sido en el momento de mayor dificultad de las sociedades europeas y sobre todo de las clases medias y trabajadoras, es decir, después de 2008 y 2010, en los momentos más duros de la crisis económica, ha sido utilizar demasiado la mano dura con los países mediterráneos en primer lugar, pero en general con todos, todos los países de todas las sociedades europeas. Ahí, por ejemplo, la crisis griega de 2015 y lo que había pasado en los años anteriores no ha sido una buena propaganda para la Unión Europea. Esto se puede recuperar, pero hace falta hacerlo y hacerlo de forma rápida. El tiempo apremia y probablemente no habrá una segunda oportunidad. En el ámbito en el que yo trabajo, en el ámbito social de familias pues, pobres, excluidas socialmente, digamos que desde el inicio, cuando yo inicio mi trabajo en 2008-2009, hay muchas familias de largo recorrido, de una pobreza cronificada. Como dos años después de la crisis, más o menos, empiezan a incorporarse en el criterio de pobreza, en el criterio estatal de pobreza y en los criterios económicos que exige nuestro programa para poder ser incluidos, empiezan a incluirse muchas familias que antes serían una clase media. Con lo cual, digamos que la pobreza en Sevilla se ha extendido mucho, ha subido mucho. Rara es la persona que ahora sale de, su, de la casa familiar en estos entornos antes de los 30. Yo en todos los barrios que trabajo no logro encontrar una, una capacidad de organización, una conciencia política de ningún tipo. Ya no hablemos de partidos políticos de los que prácticamente no saben diferenciar un partido de otro, de los grandes partidos me estoy refiriendo, no saben quién es el líder de un partido político o quién no. Hay una, una desilusión, una desconfianza y un alejamiento total de, de, la, de la política, como señores que se aprovechan de... bueno, que están en un sistema que se aprovecha de la situación, pero que nada me va a incumbir a mí que salga uno o que salga otro. ¿Qué es lo que pasa con esto? Que la mayoría de familias ni siquiera van a votar. I would like to see more support and more solidarity and more action from the middle, middle ground, the movable middle. It seems like at this moment there's a huge split, so you are either pro-current government or anti. And there's a big group in the middle which is sort of ignorant to what's currently happening. The turnout is very disappointing every, every time we have elections. I think this is where the politics happen and I would like to see more people just going and really voting. We are in Brandenburg, in Brandenburg, uh, the AfD, Alternative for Deutschland, uh, right-wing populist party, has a support in, uh, in the polls now for almost 30%. Uh, when you know that in the last elections, 25% of the people didn't show up to vote, then you understand that the whole democratic system is not longer supported by a majority. Now I'm scared. I'm really scared that people who now are getting awareness will leave the country because it will be simply not possible to live here. It's not so easy to be an activist. Arresting people uh, for protesting uh, against the government and people are losing their jobs. Trzeciej Rzeczpospolitej tę konstytucję będą stosowali, wzywamy, aby czyniąc to it's hard to be optimistic. But this government was chosen by the 20% uh, of the population, so like majority of people didn't vote. And this is the big problem, what's really 
um, a big job right now is to make people go and vote. The main problem here is the low voter turnout. Institutionally, the European Parliament is powerful. In the ordinary legislative procedure, the European Parliament has a very powerful role. It's a core legislator, it's as powerful as the Council. However, if it relies on a voter turnout of below 50%, and in some member states even much lower, in the 30s, that is, for a legitimate basis, very weak. One reason why citizens feel disconnected, I think, is also because the European Union is seen as this liberal economic beast. And I think it would help if you could make more transparent that there's also political struggle, that there's also forces towards more social elements, social rights, a different approach to the labor market. And all that is often not openly portrayed. The EU has a lot to blame for the low voter turnout in its elections and for the disengagement with the EU politics, not just in the UK, but across the EU. Because it's very bad at communicating to its EU citizens the good work that it is doing, and also bringing down what seems like complicated legislation that's done behind this big faceless face aid of the Berlin on building or whatever in Brussels. Actually bringing that legislation down to a personal level and talking to people about how that directly affects their lives. Neste momento, o que se verifica é, de certa forma, a sociedade a separar-se. O discurso de ódio e o discurso pelos direitos humanos. Verifica-se que estamos a viver um momento da história em que as pessoas têm que escolher um lado. E às vezes não é fácil escolher um lado quando não têm conhecimento sobre tal. E quando as pessoas não têm conhecimento, criam estereótipos, criam formas de pensar e de estar que, no fundo, não são as que elas defendem. E por isso é importante o conhecimento, a educação. Se houver uma sensibilização sobre a questão de, de como se deve sensibilizar e a desmistificar esses mitos, eu acredito que poderemos chegar a um entendimento e chegar a uma democracia é cada vez mais sólida. O que se verifica é que a União Europeia está muito nesse limbo. E há um choque. E a União Europeia, de certa forma, é recente. É uma, uma adolescente, não é? é uma criança. E é preciso pararmos, verificarmos e haver um balanço. It's a human story. I know politics sometimes become the overriding narrative in everything, especially when decisions are made, people become expendable. That ultimately, this is not about people becoming expendable. This is about human beings 